Welcome. This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Now I get to introduce our lovely panelists this afternoon. Um, so beginning with Stacy Feldman Hausner, uh, Stacy has successfully mediated more than 1,500 cases uh, all across uh, civil disputes and personal injuries, civil rights, employment, business, real estate, insurance coverage, construction defect, malpractice, entertainment, and intellectual property law. She's an exceptionally high settlement rate due to her tenacity, her calm and friendly demeanor, her creative out-of-the-box thinking, and her keen insights. Uh, Stacy draws on her broad mediation experience, as well as her extensive study and understanding in the fields of negotiation and mediation. And she regularly teaches it at its Pepperdine, correct? The, uh, yes, yes. the Strauss Institute. Pepperdine Law School. Yep. Fabulous. Thank you for joining us today, Stacy. Um, our other speaker this afternoon is going to be Judge Anita Santos. Uh, judge Santos joined ADR Services, Inc. in 2022 after eight years as a judge of the Superior Court in the County of Contra Costa with assignments in the Family Law Division, Felony Criminal Trials, the Juvenile Division, and the Domestic Violence Calendar. The majority of her time on the bench was spent presiding over numerous contested and complex family law matters, um, such as uh, child custody, visitation, spousal and child support, dissolutions, di distribution of property, reallocation, and tracing disputes. Yeah. Um, in, in addition to her years as a judge presiding over family law matters, uh, she served as a child support commissioner for two years, where she presided over thousands of short and long cause hearings rega regarding child support, spousal support, and attorney fee requests. And prior to her appointment as the to the bench, excuse me, Judge Santos was a sole practitioner in an active and successful family law practice. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, are you ready for us? Okay, fantastic. Yes, yes. Go for it. Okay, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Katie. Judge Anita Santos, and she has asked me to call her Anita today. And Please. I are so happy to be here with you to talk about AI and ethical topics such as truth telling and mediation, confidentiality, and civility. It's an honor to us that you're taking time out of your day to listen to our program. So thank you for that. And I hope that you've been enjoying our earlier presentations. I, uh -oh. Uh -oh. I think we just lost Stacy. So that we can all get those much needed MCLE credits. So I hope you're enjoying that. Um, and I'm ready to get started. So let's jump right in and take a look at the impact of technology and a specifically artificial intelligence, also known as AI, on the practice of law and its impact on the field of dispute resolution. And I feel a strong need to make a disclaimer at the outset, and so does Anita, that by no stretch of the imagination do we think of ourselves as tech savvy or tech, tech experts on AI. And should I ever start feeling confident and savvy, my kids will quickly show me something new um, that I don't know, and it's quite humbling. Um, I'm learning about all of this AI technology with all of you, and quite frankly, with much of the world. Uh, we are here today to share with you what we have learned about AI, and especially how it applies to litigation and Looks like we lost Stacy again. Yes, looks like we're having a little bit of audio issues. Do we have you back, Stacy? Do you hear me? Yes, we have just a little bit of a glitch running uh, on the timing of the voice. Okay. Thing. Where did you lose me? I'm so sorry. Um, we lost you right around. We're all learning together. Okay, we are all, and do you hear me now? Yes, you seem to be better now. 
Okay, I'm so sorry. Of course, it goes out right when I'm giving this presentation. I apologize to all of you. So we're going to share with you what we've learned about AI um, so far so that you can apply it to your litigation practices. We'll also share with you some of the current and developing rules around AI as it pertains to litigation. So we're going to start with AI. And for those of you who are already using it, forgive me if I quickly explain some of the basic to those of you who are less familiar. AI technology has revolutionized ugh, such a large variety of industries because it offers efficiency and productivity gains and cost reductions. The advances to date are absolutely incredible. And when I read about the capabilities of machines in the future to help us even with our basic everyday living, it's just amazing. I'd say it's also terrifying and exciting. There's lots of adjectives I can use here to describe it. Uh, many experts believe that AI is well poised to transform and impact our field of conflict resolution because it's a groundbreaking communication model. And communication, as you know, plays such a large role in conflict resolution. Uh, in simple terms, artificial intelligence is the science of making computers and machines to mimic the problem solving and decision making capabilities of humans so that it can perform tasks like humans do. Um, and it's been very beneficial. In ChatGPT is currently the most popular type of AI. And this is a large language model that allows people to act, interact with a computer in a more natural and conversational way. So the GPT part of this stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. And it is a generative AI system that involves machine learning. So it learns skills by analyzing large amounts of data on the internet, including like research and digital text, books, Wikipedia articles, tweets, chat logs, computer programs, recipes, you name it. Um, the AI, interestingly, appears to be creative and conversational. And this is because it provides outputs that identify billions of patterns in how people connect words or numbers and symbols. And then it uses that knowledge to generate its own content. AI models can be indistinguishable from human generated content, and it utilizes massive amounts of data instantaneously instantaneously, excuse me. It appears like it's mimicking human reasoning and communication with stunning accuracy because it combines and correlates information way beyond our human skills. It recognizes patterns in relationships between words and data points, and it uses relevant information, can recognize mistakes, it can spot inconsistency, and it all, does this all much faster and better than humans can do. Well, not always better, because it does get wrong results sometimes. So if you ask ChatGPT, I thought that would be fun, what it is. It told me, I am a large language model that provides high quality human-like responses to a wide variety of questions and prompts in natural language. I use vast data from books and articles and web pages so I can answer questions in a wide range of topics and engage with users in a conversational and friendly manner. Um, that's how it explains itself. Personally, I just wanna say, I think it's fantastic. I've used it to make a birthday poem, write a birthday poem for a friend. I had it help me use my dad's, uh, my dad's favorite uh, singer is Bruce Springsteen. So it helped me write lyrics that pertain to him for his uh, favorite Bruce Springsteen song It can brainstorm names. And I even used it as like a travel agent to help me plan an itinerary on a trip with my daughter. So personally, it's incredible. Um, GP, chat GPT also has what we call these hundreds of these GPTs, which are customized for a single purpose, like educational courses. So there's a negotiator coach. I haven't seen that, but you know, so much of litigation is negotiation. So you might want to check that out. There's a creative writing coach, um, a sous chef. You could you know, get some instruction on preparing your favorite recipes or food. Uh, you can take a photo, download it, and say, this is my grill. It's not working. 
And can you help me troubleshoot what could be the problem here? Um, it is absolutely incredible. Uh, so there's so much we can do. They also, you could say, I, I wish I had this when my kids were little. You could say, my daughter loves unicorns. Give me a bedtime story on unicorns and talk about this. And it'll write you a bedtime story for your little kids. So I know a lot of you lawyers out there have young ones. Um, that is a pretty interesting way to use chat GPT as well. Okay, Katie, next slide, slide please. Okay, there's a lot of different AI tools we can use. And here's just a few of them. Adobe Firefly gives you ways to ideate, create, and communicate while improving creative workflow. Gamma is crazy cool. It allows um, for working presentations, PowerPoints. We ran through a PowerPoint on squirrels that gave us pictures and ideas and a whole deck of slides on that. We didn't use that today. We used our amazing ADR staff. But if you want doing a PowerPoint, maybe you could check it out if you don't have time. Um, it's fantastic. OpenAI is a private research laboratory that aims to develop and direct artificial intelligence in ways that benefit humanity as a whole. So that's pretty interesting. Canva can produce generated images and art with a text prompt using photo generators. So you could say, I need, I want to make a new logo for my firm and put a hammer in it or make it blue or put a justice sign in it. And it will do that for you. So you could play around with that if you're looking for some new logos. Grammarly is pretty popular. Um, kids in high school and college are using it regularly. Um, it checks for any like spelling or grammar mistakes pop punctuation. If you're not a good writer, you could use it as well um, in your briefs or in your emails, um, but that, that's very helpful. Magic write, word tomb, rephrase writing to make it faster, easier. Otter is an interesting one. So this it gives you a chat bot that attends your meetings and it assists, it records your audio and it writes notes and captures action items. Um, this is problematic for mediation. So we can't have that in mediation because everything's confidential. Uh, great thing, if you're using an ADR mediator, we're on it. We, we don't allow chat GPT or Otter to record what's happening in the mediation. If you're unclear whether Otter's in there and you're wanting a conversation confidential, typically a dialogue box seems to pop up, um, but keep an eye on that. It's certainly would allow efficiency, like in a client meeting, to use something like this to summarize your notes. And then so there's, uh, yes, jump on in, please. I was just going to add, um, just th these are, there. as you said, there are so many programs. There's a list of legally, uh, legal related software we're going to get to. It's actually written out for you on slide 52. So you don't have to, and by the way, we have some 50 slides to get through in these two hours, but we have a list of them and, and descriptions of them at the end of the presentation that are specific to what we all do in the legal world. Um, and I think case text is one of them exampled here by uh, this slide and, and all of our major legal platforms, Westlaw, Lexis, uh, Law Geeks, Thomas Reuters, they all have uh, AI now. So I just wanted to throw that in there at, to the end, many more. We are going to get into so much more detail about oh, AI. I, Go and ahead, I appreciate Stacey. that. I appreciate that. Thank you, Anita. Uh, this case text sounds very cool. It can help with read your documents, gives you citation to sources, deposition preparation. So when you have some free time, you might want to take a look at all of this. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so how can AI help us in mediations and negotiations? And I want to strongly highlight that you can use, you should should be using AI as a support tool and not as a replacement tool. In other words, you have to check the results. Sometimes the output is just plain wrong. Uh, we saw that with the lawyer who was sanctioned for writing a brief and citing cases that didn't even exist. So I think if you're using this, um, be very careful. Um, if you're using it um, for things like 
brief writing or legal research. Use it more for idea generation and make sure you're really checking the work. Um, it can be very time saving for some of the lower level tasks that you may not enjoy. Um, you know, document review, legal research. Um, and that allows you to free up and spend more time on developing your case strategies and mediation strategies and spending time with your clients. So really let's use AI still at this point. I, it's getting smarter and better. It learns off of itself. So maybe a year from now, it's a different scenario. Um, some of these platforms are trying to limit the information that it can pull from. Um, and those may be more beneficial for you, but let's let's look at it as a support tool um, for now. So how can we use AI to help us optimize settlement outcomes at mediation or during negotiation? Um, one way I want to suggest is that we use it to research for information and understanding. So sometimes a dispute is very complex or you have a case and you're new to the industry or there's a nuanced area of the law that's unfamiliar to you. You could rely on chat GPT to conversationally explain to you what information you need. So it can look at like resources and people, businesses, norms in the industry, and th this type of information and give you ways so that you can conversationally explain it to maybe your mediator or a jury or even to your client if they don't understand some of this. So you can use chat GPT in a research uh, capacity and it'll give you conversational explanations that can be very helpful. Sometimes, uh, like I did a, a mediation on metal fabrication. It was a little unfamiliar to me, this industry. Um, it gave me the acronyms and was able to explain to me how the industry works. So when I, we were fat, we had a monetary component, but also a uh, non-monetary, and it allowed me to, um, to understand that and search for resolutions there. Okay, second, uh, propose creative resolutions. So as you know, most disputes, we begin with distributed bargaining. That's this fixed pie bargaining. A dollar out of one pocket is a dollar into the other pocket. And parties and lawyers tend to competitively negotiate to capture the biggest piece of the pie. Uh, they're creating the most value for their clients. However, oftentimes the resolutions will involve non-monetary components, creative components, if you will. And us mediators, we use those to bridge monetary impasses. Sometimes we anchor an entire mediation on that. Um, when the industry or subject matter is new to everyone, and our clients can be very helpful with this, and typically lawyers are too in fashioning these creative components, but maybe you could use chat. GPT and ask it if it has any ideas for resolution. You can describe the dispute, what the what the drivers are, what the hangups or obstacles could be, and maybe it could help you. So the other day I did an international fruit distribution case. Um, I had done a lot of cases, mediated cases with exporting and importing of goods, but not perishables like fruit. And this was able to, this would be able to, I didn't have to do that because the lawyers were able to work with me to brainstorm for resolutions. But this would be an example of perhaps an ability to think of some creative resolutions when you have perishable goods being internationally shipped. So these are the types of things that, you know, we could use chat GPT. Now, I just want to say, and we're going to get into this in more detail, please, please be careful because it is all public information. You are broadcasting to the world the information you're putting in. And that can be problematic for your client if there's any way to identify your client from the information. Um, so mediations are confidential. If AI is being used in your mediation, it will not be. And not only will that not be, but the negotiation, the result, all of that will lose its confidentiality. So please, please, please be careful with that. Another thing we can use um, chat GP T4 is dealing with communication challenges you may be having. So us mediators, when you're in mediation with us, we're skilled at this. We reframe communication so they're positive to settlement. And we know how to ask questions to get to underlying interests, which is what is driving people's decisions. And we know how to ask questions to do all of this. 
business. But when you're negotiating on your own and you're dealing with someone, let's say, that has a cognitive bias and they can't consider new information, maybe AI can help you get around some of that. Um, cognitively biased people often get triggered to be defensive when you're talking to them about what they did wrong or their culpability in a situation. But if you use metaphors and analogies, they often can hear it. Um, so maybe AI can help you with some of that should you find yourself having some communication challenges. AI also can be used with negotiation coaching. So oftentimes in mediation, I see you lawyers calculating midpoints, talking percentage move versus dollar moves. Defendants like to use percentage move because they're always doing a larger percent move than a plaintiff who's at a higher number. Um, it, you're trying to figure out midpoints with brackets and whatnot, and you're looking for the midpoint so that you can create most value for your client. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Perhaps AI can help you with some of this. So AI remembers, ChatGPT will remember all your previous input. So you could actually input your concession pattern as it's unfolding, or even a prior concession pattern so that it can suggest maybe your next productive move. Maybe it could help you with a bracket if you're trying to get at a particular number at the end of the day. Um, I would think that potentially it could help you. Uh, mediators out there, maybe it could help you think um, come to mediators proposals. That's a subject that's like we could spend an hour on all by itself, mediators proposal and how we do them and how to best position yourself. But maybe AI can help us. Now, again, it's a support tool. So I wouldn't substitute it for your natural intuition on all of this. Um, but it is something to think about as you're calculating and trying to figure out your next move um, in the mediation. Drafting documents. We all know that people are using AI to draft documents. And that is, we can use it to draft mediation briefs. Um, you could input your notes and what you're trying to tell the mediator. It could help you with that. Um, yesterday, I did a program for the Southern California Mediators Association on mediation briefs. It was an hour long program, uh, what to put in a brief. And there's so much more. It's not the same as what you'd give to a judge because we're not decision makers. Um, and I bet if you inputted what you're trying to communicate and asked, you know, one of these service AI um, platforms to put in a mediation brief, it would give you some of those other things that we need, like settle past settlement negotiations and drivers for the dispute and whatnot. So potentially try it, maybe use it as a starting point or check your work with it, see what it comes up with. Also with settlement agreements. So Practically speaking, most of you with settlement agreements use past settlement agreements you, you've used and um, cut and paste and make it apply to this uh, litigation. Uh, however, it might be a new industry. It might be provisions that you haven't considered before. Um, you could rely, to punch it into chat GPT. It'll give you boilerplate settlement agreements, I'm sure. Uh, ADR services, we have great short form agreements that we use, um, but you could plug that in and ask for suggestions off of that. Um, so think about that. It could maybe help you. Also, sometimes lawyers get really hung up on settlement language. And one side needs it to say this and the commas in the wrong place and the other side doesn't like this sentence. Um, maybe run it through chat, chat GPT, see if they have any recommendations that can address both of your concerns. Um, us mediators, look, we hang out, we stay with you while you're drafting um, and we'll jump in to help you get to settlement um, if should you be having a problem with the language. So rely on us as mediators, but should you not have a mediator, um, that might be something that is helpful. But I know I said ADR services, we're going to stick with you and help you get those settlement agreements drafted and executed. Um, Stacy, so, Stacy, let yes. me jump in here for a second. Yes, so we're getting please. a lot, we're getting a number of questions. I wanted to tell all of our audience, and I know there's over 900 of you, that we have a lot more detail. These are introductory comments that Stacy's making. And so your, your questions are going into the meat of what we're going to get into. So I, I was trying to answer them. I'm going to wait until we've had a chance. We're only on slide six. We've got to, we're going to get into some of the yeah. nuances. Um, so please just be patient. I know your questions are, are very specific. 
uh, and I wanted to let Stacy know that. Um, so go ahead. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you looking at the question. So thank you for that, Anita. Um, settlement agreement, just one quick thing. Get your settlement agreements signed at the mediation. All of us mediators say the same thing because we all have a million nightmare stories when you don't. Bring your settlement agreement. Um, you could even exchange it before the mediation. Get something signed. At ADR services, we have a short form. I beg you not to leave without signing something. Um, and I, I suspect all, if not most, mediators are like that. So get your settlement agreement signed. Um, next slide. Is administrative tasks. So this is pretty self-explanatory. You know, you can use it to help you with email writing. Like you meet someone and you want to thank them for something. It could help you draft an email, play with it a little, generate documents, LinkedIn posts, social media posts that gives you even hashtags. Um, so you could think about using AI for that, marketing emails, client admin forms, PowerPoints, as I mentioned before. Um, it can really make your life a lot easier if you want to use some of that. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm quickly going to just say implicit biases are a big topic in the mediation community. We have the obligation to be neutral and fair. And we, mediators talk about how can I ensure that? Do I have any implicit biases? How do I check that? So that we can give a fair and productive process for you all. Um, if you are concerned in your de own decision-making, both as a mediator, as a lawyer, that you may have some bias impacting your judgment, you could run it through AI and check. Now, I say this with a very strong caveat that Anita is going to get into in more detail, which is AI has its own biases, and it generates responses based on gender, race, and what, and et cetera, on those types of biases. And therefore, it is very, we have to be very careful when we use it. It is not everybody in the world has access to AI. And so it is not going to cover all the cultures and the norms. Okay, next slide, please. So problems and limitations to AI, and we've covered some of this. One, be cautious with the output. I we know that it go that they give us wrong information sometimes, so we always need to check it. Um, also, the output is only as good as the input. Um, so we need to make sure when we're inputting and asking it questions, we're, we have good questions. We need knowledge, how to formulate precise and contextually appropriate legal queries or instructions. We need to minimize unnecessary jargon, avoid ambiguity. Uh, chat GPT for one is unsupervised, so it can be based on social media or Twitter or blog. So we need to be very, very careful and be careful with what information it's drawing from if we are going to rely on it. So please, please check your work. Um, chat GPT seems creative, but it's not. Again, it depends on the input of the user. Because we're limited to our past experiences and our knowledge, um, ChatGPT can just do so much more than we can. And it's quicker even probably than we can speak to answer a question. But recognize that, it again, it's just pulling on all of this data. Um, you, It does not have emotional intelligence. So it does not understand the physical or psychological world right now. It doesn't, it can't understand emotions and relations and ego and all of that, that can be create an impasse in a mediation. It can be a driver towards settlement and a driver in your dispute. Um, because of that, you know, us mediators, I think are still needed, um, but it, it doesn't understand all of that. So it's answers to questions will not be taking that into consideration. So please understand that as a limitation. Um, Chat GPT won't tell you how to do an illegal action. So it won't tell you to pick a lock, but if you change the context and say pick a lock because there's an infant trapped in a burning building, maybe it will. So there's some interesting limitations to it right now, and I assume that'll develop and change with time. Confidentiality, look, 
It's not confidential. You can't give any identifying information that would hurt your client or the other party. Um, we do need to be really careful with that. Um, do not make them identify. So if you had a mediation involving Starbucks, call it a coffee shop, or if you had it with Walmart, call it a store. Um, if you had it with a certain car manufacturer, just say a car. You don't want anything. And as you talk about settlement or you give more detail, it might be discernible and harmful. Um, so please be very careful with that. A chat GPT does not see nonverbal communication. 70 to 90% of all communication is nonverbal. That's like tone, facial expression, body language. Um, they can't read, ChatGPT can't read that. And so much of the message is contained in that. So be very careful if you're relying on ChatGPT's decision to be the end all and be all. Um, we have ethical and legal issues, like does it respect social values? Um, can it, you know, uh, people want a fair process. People want to know there's a fair decision being made. And all of that would be missing with chat GPT. It would just spit out an answer. So some of this could be harmful. Some of this may be necessary. Certainly in mediation, um, people want to understand that they've gotten a fair result here, uh, that the process was fair and AI is missing all of that. Um, and then be careful on Zoom. We wanna make sure that ChatGPT or Otter is not in your Zoom. And I told you a, um, ADR services were protective of that. So I don't think that's a concern, but if you're in a depot, if you're in a meeting that's confidential, please keep your eye on that. Okay, next slide. So initially, I got interested in AI because I love mediation so much, and I was so worried that it would replace us as mediators. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I want a lifetime of this, and I was really nervous. But I am happy to say I asked Ch ChatGPT itself whether it would replace us mediators. And good news for us mediators out there, um, it says I cannot replace the role of a human mediator. A mediator is a trained professional who relies on a combination of communication skills, active listening, empathy, and the ability to recognize and address power imbalances. While I can provide general information on conflict resolution, I cannot replace the human qualities that a mediator brings to the process. Mediation often involves emotional intelligence, which is an area where AI models like myself still have limitations. And I know it's developing, and I know they're trying to get empathy into some of these AI models. Um, but for now, I think you still um, want to rely on human mediators when you can, rather than AI. Okay, well, thank you to Anita and all of you for listening to me. Um, and now Anita is going to go into more detail about how AI is developing and how we are responding um, to it within California. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you for your contribution. And I want you to keep contributing while I'm talking, okay? All right. So the first thing I want to start with, this is, a, you know, a, a requirement now coming effective this time next year. So uh, starting January 31st of 2025, uh, Rule 2.72 of the California State Bar has been revised to require two things. Uh, one is technology, and two is civility. One hour each are going to be required, uh, starting with uh, group one and group three, and then quickly followed by group two, the following um, reporting period, okay? So you will, as lawyers, we are all lawyers, um, starting as lawyers, and continuing, have the technology requirement that requires us to have at least one hour focusing on technology, um, and I asked myself, okay, that's, that seems simple enough, but what, what would satisfy that? So uh, some examples, and I'm sure you're all doing it. If not, you will be real soon. Of course, I would include training on AI, but that also includes cybersecurity, privacy, Zoom. If you're doing training on Zoom or updates on Zoom and, or other um, remote technology, that would satisfy the requirement. And electronic discovery. Some of you have been doing electronic discovery in the civil world and probate world for, for decades, if not uh, um, longer. And that 
continuing training would satisfy the technology requirement. So I just wanted to point that out to you, but you must now document it and record it. And today's course will satisfy that requirement, okay? So if we could go on to the next slide. I wanted to talk about AI. As we all know, AI is and has been the big news since it's very public beginning uh, in 2023. And we're all trying to keep up and catch up. I'm, I'm in the catch up phase of this. But the state bar, as recent as November 16th of last year, actually approved a practical guide for the use of AI in the practice of law. Now, I know that this is an evolving document, but we actually have a written document from the state bar that was just approved last November, which is ironic uh, as far as timing, because the most popular uh, platform, ChatGPT, as, as Stacy was telling us, it was released publicly in November of 2022. One year later, our state bar released this practical guide. Of course, 3.5, if you don't know, that was the original release, was uh, re Four months later, in March of 2023, it grew leaps and bounds um, faster than any other prior technology, I've been told. Um, and chat and GPT-4 was released. I, I just today in preparing to make sure there was nothing more recent. And I saw a reference to GPT-4 Plus. Don't know what the plus is, but it is continuing to evolve and and by leaps and bounds. So one of the things that I'm going to talk to you about is the practical guidance. You notice the words are not mandatory, they're practical, um, but that is one of the helpful things as lawyers that we're going to refer to. Um, you should know that rule four, um, excuse me, rule 1.1 1 .1, um, added technology to confidence almost three years ago in March of 2021, but the uh, continuing legal educational requirement is the newest one that I just referenced that started in uh, effective next year. All right, so let's go on to the next slide that talks about the practical guidance. And you'll see on the slides, and I'm not going to read them all to you, that there are other authorities that comply with the practical guidance. In this particular uh, slide, we're talking about the duty of confidentiality. Stacy talked about confidentiality. There is a duty. duty and so just so you know, and the reason I was putting off some of your questions, the next nine slides, we're going to give you practical guidance in the many areas that you are all putting your input and your questions uh, towards. So, so first of all, the duty of confidentiality. As Stacy mentioned, AI builds, it learns. And so depending on which platform you're using, AI can use everything from tweets and chats uh, to um, more reliable resources that we're all used to, like Westlaw and Nexus and Case Law. Um, so it just depends on the platform. But yes, uh, generative AI are able to use and build on everything that's input. So your prompts are critical. Which platform you're using becomes critical and for what purpose? It's not to say that generalized generative AI products are unreliable, but you're going to get the same caveats or many caveats over and over. OK, Stacy has already told you and, and started to give you examples of not entering confidential information. For example, the case name, individual names, docket numbers, specific, uh, you know, plaintiffs and defendants in any context, whether it's civil, probate, juvenile or, you know, or even criminal. You need to, and I'm I, I, having difficult pronouncing, anonymize, make it anonymous, uh, the information so that you're giving a prompt that AI can respond to without identifying specifically what you're talking about. You can talk about a slip and fall in a grocery store. What you can't put is, you know, Mary Witherspoon slipped in Safeway on this day. Therein lies the difference. Um, you all have, if you don't have, you should have and will have IT professionals, whether you hire a team or they're in-house, that you talk about and consult with on AI security. Um, and then, as I mentioned, with the, the many, many platforms, and we only listed a handful, less than 10, but with the many platforms, um, each one has a terms of use. Each one, if you dig down into the, the fine writing, will tell you how their platform works what they use to generate the resources in their platform. And you have an obligation as lawyers and as firms to review those terms of use, uh, consult with your security and decide which one is most appropriate. 
So that's the duty of confidentiality. And, and there'll be overlapping practical guidance and overlapping duties. But if we could go on to um, the next, and at any time, Stacey, if you want to add, please feel free. Okay. Okay. You're doing great. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the duty of competence and diligence, very much related to confidentiality. Um, but as we both said now, outputs can include false or inaccurate or biased information. The most common when it was first released under 3.5 or what we know now are called hallucinations. Hallucinations, under, especially under 3.5, um, you know, and as you may or may not know, there was a race to be the first to release uh, publicly accessible AI. So under 3.5, hallucinations happened in lawyers. And I even have fellow colleagues and judges that just summarily dismiss AI because under some programs, including older version, the older version 3.5, if a uh, AI didn't know a citation and was asked for a citation, it would make it up. It would literally make it, and it would read like it's, you know, Cal Fifth, 1342, and, and it would read as if it were a real citation. I can't tell you how often that happened. I don't have any statistics on it. I just know that because we as human beings are resistant to change, we often look for a reason to summarily dismiss, and we did, and I'm speaking in very big stereotypes, but we as bench officers, we as lawyers decided it was not accurate and it couldn't be trusted and not going to use it. And I can't tell you how many uh, colleagues in the beginning, certainly back in November, December um, of last year, adopted that attitude. It has evolved tremendously. And as I'm going to get to, but the duty of competence and diligence requires that a lawyer must ensure the competent use of technology. And that includes understanding the limits of the technology that includes, and I'm going to mention it again, some of these will mention several times, the duty to, we used to call it fact check, now we can call it AI check, every citation and every seemingly authority that is cited by a, an AI product, and that you understand that your professional judgment as an, an individual licensed lawyer and or a bench officer or any role therein cannot be delegated. We've all heard the story of the early lawyer that produced a brief without fact checking and it made the national news. Again, back to that obligation that we learned the hard way. Um, so the rules are 1.1 and 1.3, along with some more that I'm going to mention. Um, we have talked a lot about Chat GPT because that is the most popular, um, but there's also Google Bard. That's another one of the platforms. Um, I mentioned that the four months later in March of 2023, the 4.0 version came out. I know that when I first was trying to figure out what AI was, I went on my phone like all of us. I Googled it like all of us. <laughs> and I and what was offered free was the 3.5 version. Now that I know better, I paid, very painful, but I paid $35 for the 4.0 version for life. I know that's going to expire in the relative near future, but that was my example of, Number one, you got to learn when it's worth it to spend 35 bucks. And number two, the difference. Um, and, um, and now I've got to figure out what 4.0 plus means. But the duty of competence and diligence means we have to keep abreast of this, just like Rule 1.1 said almost two years ago or three years ago now. And 2.72, that's going to require us to have the MCLE. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, diligence and competence, uh, a lot more, when we talk uh, down the road in about six more slides. So let's go on with the next. Oh, go ahead, Stacy. No, no, I love it. I okay. love that you're giving us roadmap with slide numbers. I love it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go on to now the, the next piece of practical guidance. And this is the duty to comply with the law. That seems obvious. Um, we're lawyers and we're, we're, we're judges, we're bench officers, we're, we're paralegals, we're in the industry, or we're lay people that want to represent ourselves. And I hope there are some of you on this, this training. Uh, AI can help you immensely. And this may be controversial, but it can, whether lawyers like it or not. Um, but lawyers, we have to comply with the law. We can't engage or assist a client in anything that we know is a violation. Stacey mentioned that. AI, uh, at least without knowing how to trick it, which is probably the wrong word, but AI can't do that as well. It tries to make you follow the laws and the rules as it understands them. But you have to know that. 
And I wish I could tell you the rules and the laws of every court, every jurisdiction, every county. Just like AI is evolving, I have learned from talking with other bench officers and counties, local rules are all over the place. Judges are all over the place. I even know colleagues that say they expressly prohibit the use of AI. I find it incredible, but absolutely. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but so you need, as lawyers, you have to understand uh, AI specific laws, privacy laws. And I'm going to ask Stacy to jump in because I when I saw cross border data transfer laws, I'm going to defer to her on that because I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, but I actually. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah. I actually don't know what that means either. Okay. Very good. So yeah. that's something we could ask AI. <laughs> that was yes, my exactly. Uh, or one of you, just uh, just to, just as a starting point. Um, uh, and then, of course, you all know what cyber cybersecurity concerns are. We talked about privacy. We talked about data. Uh, and then, again, the authorities are listed on the PowerPoint slide here, the rules and the business and profession code. Um, but we have that obligation. So practically, we have to, you have to uh, set up those checks and balances. And I'll talk a little bit more in a couple of slides about what firms are going to have to do as far as training and compliance. So if we could go to slide 16, um, reminding you, because this is an ethics training course, that you as lawyers and you as supervising lawyers and managers of law firms have a duty to supervise and manage your lawyers you have a duty to establish policies, if you don't have them already, that talks about AI, when it can be used, how it can be used in your firm and by your lawyers and by your staff. Um, and it has to be prepared and something your lawyers and firms can follow. You have to give, and I'm quoting, reasonable assurance that their conduct complies with their professional obligations. You say what professional obligations? The rules are right there. And that includes 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. And that includes training on practical and ethical aspects of using AI, which would take you, I hope, full circle back to the guidance um, that was issued in November by the state bar. Notice the word guidance, not mandatory. But again, you have to develop something so that your lawyers and your staff knows, for example, and I'm going to talk about this, I can't charge what it, the time it used to take if I use AI and it takes one eighth of that time. Okay, that's just one example. But you have that obligation and that duty and it now includes AI. So if we could go to slide 17, um, generative AI and its use. So one of the tasks I was assigned when I was asked to help uh, present, and, and I will concede like Stacy, I am by means no expert, I am interested. I don't want to be left behind, as as a uh, as someone recently in one of my cases said, a uh, senior middle aged uh, bench officer. I thought that was hilarious. I share it with you. I, I'm in that category. <laughs> That's a nicer way to say old. Okay, step back. <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't want to get left behind in this in in this AI the the advancement of AI. So a practical guidance uh, in regarding generative use. Um, there, I could not find any mandatory authority, uh, meaning you shall, you know the word shall versus may. You'll see the practical guide um, that from the state bar does not use mandatory language. It is ever evolving, as I've mentioned. Um, local rules, as I mentioned, there are some actually prohibiting the use of AI, uh, including specific judges that'll tell um, lawyers, don't use AI on your phone. And if you cite it, you must tell me. I'm telling you now, you can't do it. So that is something you need to know and you need to tell your lawyers. Uh, but if you're, as lawyers, our first thought is, what's the authority for that? Well, <laughs> I haven't found the mandatory authority other than the duty to be truthful, which we'll talk about, the duty to not mislead a court, uh, et cetera. Um, doesn't mean it's not in the local rules. And if a, a court puts it in their local rules, then you have an authority, okay? So um, generative use of AI falls under the practical rule 1.4 and 1.2. The practical guidance says you should consider disclosure to a client. Personally, I think you should be required, 
but I couldn't, could, there's no authority for that. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts on that, but you consider, you should consider, according to our state bar practical guide, disclosing to the client if and when you or attorneys under you are going to use AI. Um, and then you, of course, have to listen to and adhere to your client instructions or guidelines that may restrict the use of generative AI. Uh, again, I don't know the the bottom line answer to that. If the client says, I don't want you to use AI. So that's that's a very good question. Um, Stacey, any thoughts on that? I, I'm in the same boat as you on that. I don't okay. know what. Is that, what <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, let's go to the next one. Practical guidance on work produced by generative AI and generative AI costs. I kind of gave you a tip. Uh, and the last slide, you can use as lawyers AI to create work product. I have seen some phenomenal examples, uh, and I'm going to give you one. And I and I'm going to try and attribute credit to where credit is due. I wish I could say I I knew and learned of all these things. I've attended probably a half a dozen dozen AI trainings now, and one of the very first ones I attended was back in April of 2023, just after 4.0 came out. Case Text put on a training, uh, and it's part of that training, and the program is called Co-Counsel. I am not an advocate of any of these programs, but it's just amazing. As part of that training, specifically, the trainer did uh, inputted a downloaded depot summary. In that case, and it had to have been with the release, but I assume, uh, Kobe Bryant's wife, who was deposed for thousands of hours, I believe was the citation. I can't give you the actual number. And they had the program produce a depot summary. Uh, and it produced that depot summary during the course of that training in less than 15 minutes. Now, all of you in the civil world knows that thousands of pages we could be hours, if not days, of some usually subordinate attorney's efforts to produce a very good depot summary. That training went on to show that the trainer asked very specific questions, got writ a written memo, got directed to specific areas of interest which I didn't write down to tell you, but I was, I mean, I had to pick my mouth up when I was watching the demonstration of the ability. Uh, this summary was produced in minutes and at the hit of a print for those of you like me in that advanced middle age, like still like the paper to flip and read. Um, it was it was available within 15 minutes during that hour long presentation. Um, that was just an example back in April of 2023. So there is nothing wrong and, and just so I so you're comfortable, that particular software represented it was proprietary. They had it is limited to the same software lawyers traditionally use Lex, Lex, Lexus, Westlaw, case law, federal case, and citations, not internet based. So back when I said it depends on which platform you're using, uh, if you're using Jet Cheap. GPT, you know you're using everything. If you're using a proprietary software by a legal industry, and I don't want to highlight anyone in particular because there's a half a dozen or more now, uh, and you'll see them in our resources, um, you're not risking internet-based. So when you're having these overbroad conversations with very resistant lawyers or very resistant jurists or very resistant uh, you know, staff, that some of which feel threatened, uh, you know, you need to ask and you need to know which platform their result was generated from. Um, but again, you can more efficiently create work product. Uh, and one of the requirements I'm highlighting here is you cannot charge for what it used to take that associate to produce. You can only charge for your time in reviewing the output, your your time in inputting the prompts, your time in reading and and confirming the accuracy of that AI product. And as firms, you are obligated that your fee agreement specify, just like it does when you charge for the highest partner and the lowest paralegal, the rate that you're charging for AI generated output, if any, or how you're charging for AI generated results. I do wanna share with you and uh, Katie, one of our wonderful uh, coordinators here, the one that's introducing all these programs, asked me for the authority, and I found it since she asked me. Uh, when I was attending a, in a training in November, I attended Susan Guthrie's training, and she cited that 
AI can increase productivity by 40% and boost profitability by 38%. And of course, those numbers seem astounding, right? And I'm sharing them with you because, and I'm attributing it to the speaker that I heard them from, but I also, since Miss Katie asked me to, of course, late this morning, uh, found an article in Forbes, interestingly, from six years ago, 2017, the article is entitled, Artificial Intelligence Will Enable 38% Profit Gains by 2035, and it actually cites those specific numbers. Um, it's a very interesting article uh, by Lewis Columbus, a former contributor to Forbes, um, from June 22nd of 2017. And guess how I found that? With the use of AI. <laughs> I input the statistic, and I said, what? Have you, you know, what's the authority for these statistics? And it has an even greater uh, breakdown of statistics from six years ago, which would be five years before the first publicly produced AI program was. Um, oh, thank you. I know Katie, you, she just put it in the chat. It looks like either Katie or, or Mr. Cho Hayward. Um, anyway, that would be uh, something I would think that all firms and all lawyers find increase, uh, extremely interesting to understand whether you accept it or not. So with that, those are my uh, authorities and practical guidance for how we can use AI. Moving on to slide 19. Um, again, some of these are, are very general requirements of lawyers, and, and they're, they're important because they are the authorities. For example, even with AI, lawyers have to, including with AI-generated output, uh, Check for the accuracy of the citations and the content, correct any errors and any misleading statements, because as Stacy mentioned, uh, AI doesn't have the emotional or the, the same skills that we as lawyers have. They cannot replace your, um, your ability and your obligation to review. And so, and the specific jurisdictions, I think I have, we have people attending from all over the country, if not all over the world for today's seminar. And, and I want to make sure that you understand that rules are jurisdiction specific. Um, and so, and that includes whether or not you have to disclose whether or not AI has been used. So in California, it's rule 3.1 and 3.3, your candor to the tribunal. Okay. Moving on to... Uh, the next piece of practical guidance. And this one I actually wanted to pause on. Stacy mentioned that we get back to, and that's the prohibition against discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. As Stacy mentioned, and as I'll just observe, probably an obvious observation, we have built, we human beings have built AI. We fed it databases, depending on the platform. We fed it information. We fed it statistics. And so to the extent that you believe and accept that our, we as human beings and societies and society in general have biases, have conscious and subconscious biases, um, so does our AI. It is not a standalone commodity. It doesn't self-correct. So um, I say that to say, again, firms are required and to have and draft policies if you don't have them in regards to AI. And that should include a mechanism by which counsel, staff, paralegals, your clients can identify, report, and address potential AI biases. I can tell you, I suspect the state bar is, is going to grapple with what to do with it and how to handle such reports, but we have an obligation under 8.4.1. I, I have only listed three books here that I've uncovered one of which I'm in, literally in the process of reading as we speak, and it's called Unmasking AI. It's a wonderful book that challenges and highlights potential biases and difficulties with AI. And there's others that are, are connected, some a little more tangentially, but I've listed three here. Um, I can tell you on both my Libby app, because I listen to a lot of books on, on tape now that I'm in my senior middle age, um, Libby, as well as hard books. Um, that discuss the evolution of AI, how it's taught. And I'm waiting for ones that, that are more legal specific, but I, I don't have a legal specific book to cite you to. But these books are great in helping us all understand that AI has the same faults that our society has and us as individuals have. 
So that falls under 8.4.1. And that's um, all I have to add on that. Um, okay, it, I just got note from Hayward that we are at the half halfway mark. We had committed to taking a very short recess for those of us that need to take a break, get a cup of coffee, go to the bathroom. So now's as good a time as any, and we'll pick up with the last couple of practical guidance uh, slides after our five minute recess, okay? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so picking right back where we left off, the 21, slide 21 is, is re repetitive, but gives you the actual authority. 8.5 is the rule of professional responsibility that says that a lawyer should analyze relevant case law and regulations of each jurisdiction in which you're licensed to ensure you're complying. I've already said that, but I can't say it enough. Um, now we're going to go into just a couple of examples of tools and information and platforms. And I'm going to remind you slide 52 at the very end of our presentation. It's going to give you a list of different AI uh, legal related um, platforms and programs and apps, whatever term you like to call them. So the first one, and again, this is from a training that I attended, um, is Peacemaker Legal. That is a, a, a training I attended on November 8th of this year. And that particular software was developed. The AI software was developed specifically for negotiations and mediations. And it allows you, there's a video. You can go to the Peacemaker Legal website. Uh, and there's a video that you can watch that shows you how to use the, the, the software and what it can do, it, how it can help you do uh, dry runs or practice runs and use different skills and then hone your skills in neg negotiation and mediation. And uh, chat GPT has a mediation simulation option. I think like Stacy mentioned that um, there's, uh, you know, and the at least two of the many websites, mediate.com and arbitrate.com have some version of AI generated um, tools to help you use media or use AI to assist you in honing skills and learning strategies in mediation and specifically using, you know, the was fence dispute between neighbors to use something simple. You know, uh, it'll, you know, you can use, 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 give an answer and it'll give you a prompt. So these are things that are available to you. Um, specific to our world. Another tool on the next slide for AI use, and I found this to be particularly helpful when I was struggling to understand AI. I still think of it as Google on steroids, but it's so much more. It is so much more. Um, and it talks to us in ways that are like you're talking to a mentor lawyer a mentor like Stacy, And I'm like, you know, if Stacy's not available, I can now go to an AI program and say, here's what I'm looking at, or here's the situation I'm poised with. And so some very helpful tools and you'll, is, for example, Right Law. It's a, it's a company. I, I don't know if that's the right name, but Right Law has created AI cheat sheets. And I put, I had Katie put in the link there for you. It's again going to be on slide 52. There's like eight or nine of them and they're multiple pages long, but they give you specific language to use, specific follow-up to get the optimal response from AI. Um, it explains to you, for example, we use GPT like it's an everyday word, um, but it explains to you that you can use AI in the form of like a chat bot for those of you that like chat box, yeah, or you can use it in the form of... Um, but the way we've been referring to it, the only way I've used it, like chat GPT, you type in your request um, and it explains to you the different types of mod their large language models that Stacy mentioned. But it's more specifically, it gives you prompt tips. I printed and I have them in my hand. I'm looking to my left here because I'm looking at them. It, I printed writing prompts uh, and I print and it tells you and one is seven pages long, the types of words that are best to get the best response to narrow your search to to um, talks about the engineering of AI. And so these are free to all of us. Right law doesn't care. They've, they've said, here's the link. Use our prompts. Um, it helps us understand this world that we are now in, whether we want to be or not, and to understand it and use it to our benefit. So I want to pass it on to you. Uh, to encourage you to uh, consider AI. 
<laughs> and consider the often quoted for me now uh, concept that those that refuse will be the ones that are left behind. Yes. Now, you can accept that or not. Um, now, I do want to point out, um, I'm talking all things AI, one of the trainings I attended was attended or David Freeman Ingstrom, a professor at Stanford Law School, was one of the presenters. And I tied his presentation to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. He is a proponent, uh, much to the concern of lawyers who think they're going to be replaced. I don't, but he is a proponent and he um, talks about all the different ways AI can be used, many of which we've mentioned, but things that were sh shocking to me, uh, especially a neophyte in the mediation world. Um, AI can predict case outcomes. You know, like we're, those of you that are football fans like me, we're watching. You can't watch football now without the percentage prediction on the screen, which is not a bad thing. You know, tell you this team has a 67% chance to win. And, you know, I watched, I've watched, been watching it all season and I watched it on the wild card games. I'm going to watch it this Sunday. But that is AI generated. Those predictions, um, same in the legal world. It can predict case outcome. Offer the value of a claim. Now, whether or not you accept that, at least it's giving you a place to start from all the input that that AI program has to give you the value of a claim. It can estimate the cost of litigation. When you're uh, trying to figure out how to settle a case or not settle a case, uh, and you want, as we often have done for my entire legal career, back to the Let's say back to the 90s in my advanced middle age, um, it can offer you the estimate of what it would cost to litigate that case. That gets the ear of clients. That gets the ear of people who say, well, just go to court. Well, okay. Do you have somewhere in the realm of this amount of money? So AI can help you uh, figure out what that amount is. It can draft initial complaints, discovery, routine discovery requests. For those of you that are not lawyers or not in the legal field, it can explain to you in layperson's language. It used to be how I switched from criminal law to family law. I went out and bought NOLO press books because it explained to me what I needed to understand in family law until I could fine tune it in a more sophisticated way. Well, now you have AI that can explain to you in plain language when you upload a legal document, what are they telling you to do? How many times as non-lawyers do they get this packet of documents and they just stare at it with these big eyes because they don't understand what does it want? <laughs> you know, what do they want? What are they asking for? So AI can do that. It can give you options. And, and I haven't done this, but I've read and I've learned from Professor uh, Freeman Engstrom. It can, if you read it a narrative, it can tell you, it can translate that into a complaint or a legal action. Here's an action you could bring based on what you've uploaded or narrated to me. So those are amazing uh, things. Um, and so I, only, I also mentioned, and in all fairness to Professor Freeman Ingstrom, he wrote an article, which I've cited here at the bottom of the slide, that talked about, and he's a proponent of allowing non-represented individuals uh, to be able to draft and file their own legal pleadings, which I believe in California, you can still do. It just has to be in the right format, right? Well, he is he has written this article, which I have to have to share uh, because he, as you can see from the title of it, why do blue states keep prioritizing lawyers over low income litigants? And which is why I made my opening comment about how this might tie to diversity, equity and inclusivity. When you have 80 percent, for example, 80 to 85 percent of family law litigants that don't have lawyers they can be lost in the legal process. Um, they very rarely even come to the private judging world. Uh, AI can be a resource that they could use to at least understand, if not participate somewhat effectively, or even more than somewhat effectively in this process. So I'm not an advocate for his position, but I think we have to accept the benefits of AI in that context. It can include a lot more people that can be much more competent in this process. And, and so for that reason, I bring that up under our training on, you know, equity and ethics in the world that we are in. So that is uh, my reference to him. So I'm going to just give a couple of more comments before I'm going to turn it back over to Stacy. Um, but if we could go to truth telling and mediation, that's the next area we're going to switch to. 
And that's those, those words <laughs> alone are, are quite, did I skip something here? I didn't. Let me see. Okay. So we're going to go back to ethics. We're going to talk about basic ethics, how they apply to AI and non-AI human behavior and tie it all together. Um, but going to the next slide, I want to remind everyone that California Rule of Professional Conduct 3.3 tells us, and this is that mandatory language, that a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or court or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previously made by to the tribunal by the lawyer. And so that is that applies to everything, including AI, including us lawyers. And um, the California Rules of Professional Conduct also talks about, next slide, truthfulness and statements to others. And so this is a you know word intensive slide, but the short of it is that lawyers and representing a client does not give you a pass to be untruthful, to be disingenuous, to tell a lie, you know, and I graduated my language <laughs> so we can use any term we want, but you cannot knowingly make a false materials uh, statement of fact or law. Um, there are some exceptions in the fine print. I even went on to look up those exceptions and make sure I understood them. And that reminder is that you as a lawyer still have to maintain the confidence of your client, even at, and I'm quoting, every peril to yourself to preserve the secrets of, of his or her client. And then ABA rule 1.6C, which was adopted universally, um, that a lawyer shall make every reasonable effort to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure or unauthorized access to information. And that goes back to the AI caveat and warning uh, relating to the representation of a client. So that is the overall requirement of all lawyers in regards to representing your client and it equally applies to AI. So with that, we're gonna. I'm gonna go back to you, Stacy, to take the lead if you don't mind. All right. Thank you. <laughs> well, Katie, if you could just go back, back to the previous slide because I want to just point something out on the comments section of Rule 4.1, and that's comment number two, and it says this refer rule refers to statements of fact, but whether a particular statement should be regarded as one of fact can depend on the circumstances. And they talk about negotiation. For example, in negotiation, certain types of statements ordinarily are not taken as statements of material fact. And I think that's important because we're going to be talking about truth telling. Okay, now you could go to the next slide. I appreciate that. And thank you for all that information, Anita. Uh, I really appreciate it. I thought it was very interesting. Um, we are going to talk about truth telling or lying um, in mediation. And so many times us mediators will tell you, we hear accusations, the other side is lying, or that's just not true, or they're not hearing good faith. Um, those types of comments and people are flabbergasted and upset at what the other side is telling us. Um, I want to start just by saying, what is a lie? Um, it's typically when someone intentionally communicates something that is not true. And they can do this by actually verbally communicating it, or they can do this by an omission. But it's seems that there's a very clear standard here and it deals with the mindset of the communicator. So, you know, in a mediation, do we have intentional untruths happening? And sometimes we do, um, but sometimes we don't. And the listener is feeling like an, an, an untruth is being told, that something intentionally is being told to us. Um, I worry about this in a mediation, and I worry about it because it can become an obstacle to settlement. When the listener feels that the other side is deceiving the mediator or trying to deceive them, they may not want to engage in productive negotiating behavior, and it can become an obstacle to getting what you want. 
And so there is an advantage to trying to tell the truth in a mediation, or at least prevent the listener from thinking that you're not telling the truth. Um, there's different severities of untruths. Um, what tends to happen a lot of times is the listener thinks it's a lie, but we just have two different truths. So somebody may say the light was red when I entered the intersection and you go in the other room and they could swear to you it was green. They each think the other one is lying, um, but it's really just a different perspective. And this happens a lot. I mean, we can have different perspectives because of cognitive biases, confirmation bias, and that again is a whole topic in and of itself. Um, but we can also vantage points and whatnot. Um, so sometimes we think, ah, this is a lie, and really it's just a different truth. Now, let me say, as mediators, we're not so worried. We're not decision makers. So I don't, I expect some sort of fibbing going on in the mediation. And I need to jump into any of this <laughs> anytime, please. Um, I expect it. Uh, I worry more about how the other side hears it and what they're going to do when they hear it. So don't get so worried about us mediators hearing something that's not true. You'll help us push back and change that perception and make sure the decision makers know there's risk if that's going to be their narrative or if that's going to be their position at trial. So I'm um, keeping my and So I would jump. Yes, jump right in. I was just going to jump in and say that is particularly true in family law. And I will say it, you know, two different versions of the same, what you would argue or say the same marriage. It's very common. It's just like with your siblings, you know, you have two different versions of your childhood or three or four. And, you know, there's some overlapping and there's some, do you grow up in the same household? So that doesn't, con and that's very common. Um, and the other thing I was going to say, I absolutely join in on Stacy is your perception of, we don't have to decide who we believe or don't believe. That is not your role, at least in trying to settle or negotiate a case. So I, I wish I could, I say it many times, but I wish more attorneys would help me help their clients here that you don't need to convince me or Stacy or whomever your neutral is or your, your attorney, uh, you know, I mean, well, maybe not your attorney, but you know, whoever's helping you settle your case as to that you are the truth teller. Uh, you know, we could save so much time in that. So go ahead. I appreciate that. Okay. Another thing is sometimes you people think it's a lie when it's really an opinion that differs and it's not based on the fact. So when you're talking about future damages, we can have a disagreement or an ability for someone to work again or find, find comparable employment. Um, once I may say, that's a lie, that's an exaggeration. No way can this person not find a job. And the other person is saying, Stacy, look, I've tried 20 applications, no one's hiring me. Prices for a business, um, the value of someone's work or a piece of property, all of that can be opinion as opposed to a lie. And people feel deceived sometimes when it's just a different opinion. You know, as a mediator, it actually helps me because I can show the clients like, look, this is what's going to happen at trial. They're going to say this narrative. You're going to say the other. They're going to offer this opinion. You're going to offer the other. And that's where the real risk lies. So let's get some certainty, get this case settled, um, and uh, understand that each other has a different perspective or a different opinion. Um, also, keep in mind, sometimes people lie unintentionally in the moment. And when you're in a dispute, and we already have heightened emotions from clients, right? If it's risen to the level of litigation, people are tend to be stressed out. There's lots of tears in my mediation as they relive the events that led to the dispute. So people are, are heightened emotion. And when they're asked something and someone expects an answer, people will often lie, like a gut reaction, a lie to protect their interests. And they get defensive or they exaggerate or they um, even directly just lie about it. Um, I see this a lot in mediations when they feel put on the spot. Um, and this is something that we see with cognitive biases, these heuristics, this quick thinking gut reaction. Um, so for example, I had a case involved a failure to disclose a water leak in a piece of property. And when they were at, when the seller was asked, were there any other leaks? 
leaks. That water leak in the bathroom, which caused the main damage, had been repaired, but there had been like five or six other leaks. And reflexively, the seller said, no, there wasn't another leak. I go in the other room and the buyer very quickly shows me evidence of all the other leaks. Um, so we got to keep this in mind that there's this defensiveness. One thing mediators want you to do is share briefs or get information to the other side. Um, this kind of counteracts some of that problem because it slows down some of that defensive thinking and allows people to consider it. So we got to give people who are having gut reactions a little bit of time. Now, this slide we have up here, and I need to jump in with me on all of this, are typical types of statements people lie about. And some do direct lies, some exaggerate, or what we call puffing. Um, some are telling half-truths or omitting answers to give us the wrong impressions. Um, but these are the types of things that we typically see. Lies about top line or bottom line, best, final, um, last, best, and final. I can't tell you how many times I have a last, best, and final. <laughs> All right. That they don't stick with. So it doesn't us mean that. Mediators, no, us mediators know it. Um, don't, I don't care if you call it your last best and final. I mean, it's helpful to me to know this is where you want to stop. And now the negotiation changes a little. Um, but it is not, if the other side is lying, I just say, don't worry about it. Just test it. You know, don't accept it if you don't want it. Give a different number and let us let us work there. Uh, Anita is so I think negotiation lines are expected. I actually think it's even a good negotiation strategy because you're trying to get the best you can for your client. I don't advocate lying. Maybe you can use words that aren't lying, but try to get your client the best deal they can. And I'm not concerned about that. What about you, Anita? So I guess I I because I limit myself to the family law context. It is very helpful. It's not very helpful when I have outright lies. I mean, it's not very helpful at all. The rules are different. There's less, there are fewer variables. So, um, and it, to bring them together, you know, it's just a question of, you know, when you purchased a particular thing and how much you put down and it's often easily disputed. So, so that's just my impression on that. But I do expect it, and I certainly expect the posturing, and and I expect the emotional entanglement that you have to weave through. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you for that decision. Whether decision makers are present or authority, I don't like this lie personally because I have more influence and ability to settle if I have the decision maker in the mediation. That I want them to hear what the other side's talking about. I want to have some ability to persuade them. The, both sides to evaluate the case more similarly, because if I get you into a zone of potential agreement, we call this ZOPA. Um, when you have, uh, when I have a zone of, I can typically get this case settled. So I like the decision makers in the room. Sometimes you all lie about that. Um, I, my thing is get them in the room. If you are on the other side and you suspect that the decision maker is not in the room, I would recommend that you make it contingent on showing up at the mediation. So if you need the CEO or the, all the board members or uh, the adjuster in the room, say to the other side, are you going to have them in the room? I'll come to mediation as long as they show up at the mediation. Um, that, I think it's advantageous. Insurance coverage, I think that's a problem to lie about that personally, um, because that is, sometimes people take pennies on the dollar because they don't think there's insurance coverage and the insured has no money. If that is the case, then there's arguably fraud in the inducement of the contract. Um, now, if you suspect, I, as a practice point, let's say you're relying on someone's representation of no insurance or a low policy limit, I would ask for proof of that if I were on the other side. That would be one way to protect your client. Or I would put it in the recitals of the settlement agreement. So typically settlement agreements, when we're going to get into this, you waive confidentiality for enforcement of the agreement. So when there's a breach, the judge can actually look at the settlement agreement. And if it's in the recitals, the judge can see that you relied upon it. If it's not in the recitals, the judge can't hear about it because everything said in a mediation is confidential. So if there's coverage and you're relying on it, or same with this solvency bankruptcy, um, if somebody's claiming they have no money, 
And sometimes they claim this and I go in the other room, they say, they have five yachts, 10 pieces of property. They own three mansions. Um, sometimes somebody feels they have no liquid, no liquidity or their company is, you know, is inconsistent or seasonal. Um, so I don't know necessarily it's a lie versus a perspective, but let's say it is. I demand financials. I typically ask um, a defendant who's claiming that to show P&Ls or tax statements or any other type of financial proof of this. Um, but again, you can protect against it, put it in the recitals. Lying about witnesses. Some of you do that. The witness is going to say this. Do your research because I'll go in the other room and they'll say, well, that's interesting because I talked to this witness yesterday and look at this declaration the witness signed for me. Can you show it to the other side? So uh, lying about witnesses are somewhat expected, but be careful because if the other side has done their research, they're going to be able to disprove you and um, they're not going to trust you and give you what you want when you're looking for settlement. So how next slide, please, Katie. And Stacey, I just want to know if you saw yeah, the please. warning. We've got about a minute per slide if we were to pace it. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's going to be tough on this one. Um, mm -hmm. How do we reduce the amount of lying in your negotiation? Number one, prepare. The more you know about this case, the more you're going to disprove everything theater, that's not true. Um, I, some of lawyers, you know, you're busy or your associates work up the case and you don't know what's happening. The best counteract to lying is preparation. Um, if you're skeptical, the other side is lying, have them put it in writing. People are less inclined to lie in writing. Um, ask, put it in the recitals for your settlement agreement. Um, make it a contingent. So let's say I get you a creative result. I did this the other day. Uh, roofer, there's lots of leaks. I have the roofer replace the roof. Um, but the plaintiff needs it done in three months. And the roofer says, no problem, I'll get three months. Well, protect yourself. If it's not done in three months, X is the penalty or they will do give me Y. So you can make agreements contingent, rely on us mediators. We do this all the time. We can figure out ways to protect your concerns if you think the other side cannot perform in the way they promise. Uh, negotiating in person is good. Um, Nonverbal communication, I told you 70, 90%. People are less inclined to lie to your face. So you want to go in person, um, you'll, you will discourage the lying. Um, working collaboratively is going to help. People are less likely to lie to someone who's being honest with them, who's brainstorming and working with them. People they trust, people they like, they are going to be less likely to lie to. Um, also, they're not going to want to harm the relationship they have or the reputation in the community. So this is, you know, have a good relationship with opposing counsel, um, have a respectful, yeah. trusting uh, verifying lawyers' claims. So lawyer agents of someone are more likely to lie. They do studies to somebody than the person is themselves. So under that theory, but you lawyers, you're not allowed to lie because of the model rules. But th they've looked at agents and they see they lie more than the people. Now, having a mediator is great because I'm in contact with the client. And I'm at tech, typically I'm asking the client questions about the facts. Um, I'm hoping they are going to answer rather than the lawyers. Um, but using us mediators are helpful for that. And typically as lawyers, you don't get access to the client other than the deposition. Um, but you can counteract that some of this agency line by getting directly to the client. Um, do your research so you're ready to go. Using a test question, some of you do that. Um, you'll say, Stacy, go in there and ask them if they've ever received an email saying you have poor performance with your employment. And I'll go in there and ask them to say, no way, I've never received this email. I come back in and guess what's waiting for me? The email. Um, so you could do a test question if you're trying to show your mediator or the other side, knock it off. We know the truth here. Um, and then framing proposals as gain. So people are more likely to lie when they feel like they're losing something. Um, there is 
again, this is like a half an hour discussion on loss aversion and gains and risk aversion. Um, but we want to show the advantage of the deal. So as mediators, we naturally do this for you. We show you the silver lining, the benefits of taking the deal. A woman by the name of Mary Kern, she's at Baruch College, and Dolly Chug of NYU did a study with MBA students in a negotiation simulation. And they found that this the students were less honest when they were told that they were facing a 75% chance of a loss than they were when they were told they were facing a 25% chance of a gain. Simply that reframing of language. Us mediators, we are doing all the reframing for you. We take out toxicity. We make it productive to settlement. But if you don't have us, sell the benefit to the other side. You're trying to get them to accept a deal you want. So let's convince them of how great this deal is. And finally, it's not helpful to call someone a liar. Um, they're going to deny it and they're going to dig in and defend themselves. They're not going to say, oh, you got me. Um, that is not a typical reaction. So it's better to use I statements. My kids learned these on the playground yard when they were young. Um, I see it differently. I don't see any support for this position. I have a sub rosa video showing you throwing a ball and running with your dog, even though you said you're in bed every minute of every day. Or I have, the other day I had someone say, um, ask them if they've been to the gym. And the plaintiff says, no, I haven't been to the gym since the accident. And then they pull up three months of everyday gym records. You know, some of that uh, can be used to counteract it. Um, but calling someone a liar is not going to be helpful. And us mediators don't do that. All right. I don't know if I hit the one minute mark, but I certainly tried. Okay, we are going to jump into mediation confidentiality. And I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as we can so we can get into civility. When we talk about confidentiality, we're really, people tend to think of three categories. One is the admissibility of trial. Um, is it the formal rules of evidence? Is it getting into evidence at trial? Do I have to worry about what I'm saying because the judge or the jury is ever going to hear it? The second way we talk about it is in caucus. So everything typically in Southern California, caucus is the model. We start in caucus, we stay in caucus. Um, we'll use joint session as a tool towards settlement, but most of you lawyers want caucus. Um, there's a level of confidentiality and privacy in caucus, and you can tell us things and tell us not to tell the other side. We absolutely would not tell the other side. So that's another way we talk about co confidentiality. And lastly, when we say confidentiality, some of you assume it just means privacy. If you went to coffee with your friend, you'd say, okay, can I tell you something confidential? And you would say, okay, yeah, that means I'm not telling anybody else, okay? Please know that confidentiality does not mean the third thing. It does not protect from anything said in the mediation from anyone outside the mediation hearing it. Because the federal rules of evidence, state rules of evidence, state rules of court are going to control confidentiality. Next slide. Okay, so federal rules of evidence say that everything said or written in a mediation is not admitted to prove the validity or invalidity of your claim or for impeachment. California evidence codes, we've got sections 1115 to 1123, and they're telling us the same thing, but they're not dealing with impeachment. I don't know. No one knows if impeachment evidence is going to be allowed in. It's going to be up to your trial judge. Um, but we're keeping everything written and set in a mediation from evidence at a civil proceeding. Next, please. So settlement agreements, those are those are a little bit different or a lot different than, than mediation, even though with the inclination, myself included, is to treat them the same. They're not the same. Uh, they have their own se sections, which is includes 1123, 1119C, uh, 1152. So settlement agreements uh, are inadmissible, except for when you reach an agreement and you want it enforced. So you agree. Therefore, here's our agreement. Here, court, is what we agreed to. And this is what we want enforceable. Um, and you need to include that 
well, I recommend, we recommend you include that. Um, of course, an agreement can be used if there's an allegation of fraud or duress or illegality. Um, and I know that at the bottom advice is to put an express waiver in, but if you use language like this is enforceable by civil, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that makes it very clear that you're agreeing. Um, confidentiality in a settlement agreement, however, is different in that in mediation in general, everything said or done is confidential. And we have 20 minutes left. Thank you, Hayward. <laughs> everything is confidential. In a settlement agreement, that is, it's not quite that broad. It's uh, communications, negotiations to settle the case are confidential. But the fact that there was a settlement agreement, the fact that there's there are mandatory settlement agreements, that is, in and of itself is not confidential. And oftentimes in many courts, including the court where I sat, you filed your settlement conference statement with the public court, meaning it was open to the public. Um, so it depends on local jurisdictions, but certainly um, negotiations that did not result in a settlement are, are what are confidential and settlement agreements different than mediations. So I'm gonna whip through and let Stacy wind this up um, in the next few slides so we can try to cover civility. Go ahead, Stacy. Okay, when is the mediation finished? This matters. Um, some of you just assume you're still protected by the privilege and you're not necessarily. So do you, if you have a fully executed written agreement, um, the mediation is obviously over. 10 days without communicating with your mediator, make sure you still have mediate confidentiality if 10 days have passed. And if the parties agree to terminate the mediation, that will be the conclusion of the mediation. So keep in mind when it's finished, it could impact confidentiality. Limits to confidentiality. Um, okay, so we, you know, we as mediators, we want information that helps us shift perspectives, get you to evaluate the case more similarly. There are limits to confidentiality that you should be aware of when your mediator is telling you, don't worry about it. Everything is confidential. It only applies to evidence in a civil proceeding. It doesn't make information private. So if you have litigation or potential litigation with other employees, or I, I've done a lot of product liability cases with medical devices, and they have 50 cases pending, that is not going to all of a sudden make everything said in the mediation confidential. It will just apply to admissibility. It doesn't, at civil proceeding, it does not apply to criminal proceedings. So when I do business cases, and there's a criminal investigation pending or fraud allegations or potential for anything criminal, please be protective of your client and aware that that can come in in a criminal proceeding. Next. <laughs> Confidentiality statutes do not protect information communications from discovery, really. Know if you're past your discovery cutoff date. If you are not, they can take information that you, they've learned through the mediation and just take more discovery on it. They can't say, did you say this at the mediation? That is not discoverable, that communication. However, if you say, look, I have a bunch of onshore, offshore bank accounts, they could ask you about these. Um, give They could do a document request for all documents related to all onshore and offshore bank accounts. Um, so be careful with the discovery cutoff. Um, that can be very important in terms of whether or not you're revealing information. You got to do a balance as lawyers. Am I going to go for it? and give them everything um, with the information because I really want to settle it and get them to see the case the way I do? Am I going to hold some back until I see that we're in a range of settlement and it can settle? Do I need to pro be protective of litigation so I don't want to share it? You got to really do an analysis here. Work with your mediator. Um, they can give you a sense as well. Um, but we are very protective of your information. We don't want to mess up your litigation. Okay, next. States have different confidentiality protections. I tell you this because California is very broad and very vague. It seems to just protect everything. And to the extent it doesn't or we don't know, it just hasn't gone up um, and had a court decision on it. Other states are less, are much less 
broad. They have a ton of exceptions and the communications aren't that protected. Why does it matter? Because especially it matters now because we're on Zoom and I'm mediating with people all over the country and all over the world. And what happens if someone in Colorado makes the communication and I'm in LA, but someone else is in Louisiana, what confidentiality statute applies? We do not know. We do know the forum state judge will be making the determination, but we don't know what state law applies. And there are a lot of exceptions in a lot of states that we don't have in California. So if you need to protect your client, if like high profile cases or cases um, that nobody can find out the information or search then you need to be really careful here with this. Now, one way around it is to contract and say, look, we want California law to apply. However, we've seen in other states where the judges are not enforcing these confidentiality state forum choices. So be careful here with that. Next slide. The Uniform Mediation Act, 13 states have this. This is an example of not a very protective confidentiality state. There's all these exceptions. So one is agreements signed by the parties. You don't have to waive confidentiality like Anita said or use the magic language to do so. If documents need to be open to the public, they're not, then they're going to let them in. If somebody threatens to commit bodily injury or an ongoing crime, that comes in. I personally like that. Um, it allows, um, that, I think that's for the public good, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, mediation, if you're suing your mediator for malpractice, they're going to be able to defend themselves. Those communications are coming in. But look at evidence not otherwise available will come in. So that defeats confidentiality to a large extent. So we've got 13 states now, um, maybe more are going to adopt it, but let's be aware that you gotta be careful here if you really are banking on confidentiality. Next slide, please. There is a case. So when I started mediation, we didn't have this case. Um, Cassell versus Superior Court. This came out and uh, client was suing their lawyer for things the client didn't tell, the lawyer didn't tell their client in a mediation. So they were suing for malpractice. And the lawyer said, went to the trial court and said, I'm so sorry for my client, but it was confidential. Nothing in a mediation can come into evidence. And the trial court agreed. It went up to the appellate court and the appellate court said, no, this can come in because the statutes to protect the client, not to protect you lawyer from malpractice. But it went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court agreed with the trial court and said, even in a different civil proceeding, confidentiality applies. Mediation communications will not come in in a subsequent or different civil proceeding. Um, the, the, the court said, look, legislature, if you want to change this, you don't like this, do something about it. So the mediation community jumped on this. They want to protect confidentiality. And the legislature came up with um, a compromise and it's through 1122 evidence code and 1129. And it requires you attorneys to get written acknowledgement from your clients prior to the mediation that the mediation communications are confidential and inadmissible. So they found the compromise in making sure your clients are notified. Please make sure you have this writing. I remember when it first came down, I had the writings for everybody to get their clients to sign before we get started. Most of you know about this now. If you don't, it, it's a good practice to take a look at, at these sections. Next. What can we do given the limits to confidentiality? You could do confidentiality agreements. So most of the time when you settle, you have confidentiality provisions, not always, but you mostly do. Um, it, but what happens when you don't settle? Do you want everything talked about? Because they could go out to the media, they can go anywhere and talk about us. Us mediators don't, We're, we have ethical rules saying, don't talk about it, don't identify it. Um, but the lawyers or the clients can. So a lot of people want to use confidentiality agreements to make stricter protections. Think about that. Um, there might be an advantage to no confidentiality to your client. There might be an advantage to confidentiality, um, but work with the other side or talk to your mediator if you need these types of agreements to be protective. Um, be careful here. Don't just willy-nilly sign a confidentiality agreement. I know some mediators use them. 
Um, but take a look at them. Make sure you're not getting rid of any of the protections that you have under the law. I worry that if you're just signing a document saying it's confidential, that you really um, could be harming your client. And think about whether you don't want to sign it because your client wants this information out. So just be mindful of all of this and don't just go through the motions. All right. Next slide, please. Caucus, I told you we've got information, we have confidentiality there. Talk to your mediator. Information management is huge. So you give us 20 reasons. You want your mediator to use the, you don't want them to dilute your arguments and give 20 reasons. Like we manage your information for you. Hopefully your mediator does that. If you're worried your mediator is going to give 20 arguments, don't give them all the arguments at one. Talk to your mediator, what they can share, what they can't share. Um, we want to be protective of that. Um, and so just be very upfront with your mediator and communicative. If you want permission to share something, we typically are asking you about it and making sure that you're comfortable with how we're sharing it, what we're sharing, when we're sharing. Um, so that's a pretty, uh, good mediator practice for all you mediators out there. Next, please. <laughs> confidentiality concerns with the AI. I, I, we've covered this in detail. It is not confidential. So you have to be very, very careful if you're using AI. Um, don't ever do something that could identify your client. You could actually hurt your client. Um, so be careful. And I, we don't have time to go back through that. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to take the option to, to not, I, I thought it was fun to bring it full circle. And I asked AI uh, in two different platforms, uh, you could see the difference of the responses. I'm going to let each of you read that on your own. I use Bing to ask them to describe the difference between confidentiality and mediation and settlement conference. And, and, and the three lines below are the authorities they use to cite. I thought that was helpful for you to know and show you that AI pulls from multiple resources. The next side was the same question to co-counsel through chat GPT-4. So they've They've used chat GPT for similar, but more, more detailed answer. Again, citing uh, so you know what uh, authorities. And um, I asked for follow-up details on the next slide. Uh, and I asked the, and, and I was trying to show you how you build on AI, as you'll learn when you look at those prompts, you can keep building on the information you got. You can be more specific. I asked them to cite me the authorities, the code sections, the rules of conduct. So, you know, the days of us having to either go into Lexus or Westlaw or, or hand search, it's available at your fingertips to confirm that it's accurate. But I wanted to show you that, number one, in this particular follow-up, AI gave you the disclaimer we're giving you. you need, this is complex. You need to talk to a lawyer. You need to confirm our answer at the beginning, at the end. Also, that it did, in fact, on this side, it gave us um, accurate answers, but I thought incomplete answers, especially on the second one, it talked about the civil code difference as opposed to the uh, evidence code and rules of court. So I wanted to show you an example of the caveats we're saying and the, the follow-up that you're requiring. I, I don't need to read these to you. Read them on your own or do your own AI search. And so if we could move on to, um, I think I think we should skip the summary too. We, I agree. Great. Okay. So we can have the last, you know, uh, what, seven minutes here to cover civility, the second part of our training. Let's go to the next side. I love incivility. I never would have used that word, but I love it. Uh, I remind you, uh, 2.72 is the new rule that required. We talked about technology competence. The second area it requires is a civility requirement and at least one hour of continuing legal education starting one year from now, January 31st of 2025, um, you have to have, we have to have an additional hour of civility in our required training. So I just want to highlight next slide that I'm sure you noticed in 2014, some nine years ago, our oath was changed to require uh, the line that's quoted at the very top. I don't need to read it to you. That was part of acknowledging Civility is an express thing that we need to continue to do, acknowledge, learn, and require. So it's part of our oath. My apologies. And I'll slip over to Stacy and let my dogs be quiet in the bedroom. Next slide. <laughs> okay. So one thing with 
civility if you are toiling with whether or not you want to behave that way in mediation. I want to tell you that they've done social science experiments and they found that people give more to people they like or respect or connect with, this affinity. Um, Robert Cialdini, he's a social scientist. He wrote a great book um, called Science of Persuasion and Persuasion. Most of us mediators know about this because we are in the business of persuasion. Um, but this book gives a bunch of principles on how to get people to do things they ordinarily wouldn't want to do. And one of the main principles is getting the other side to like you or funny. And they did this in the context of, initially the study was in the context of Tupperware sales. And they found the Tupperware saleswoman who was most like had the most sales. Since then, this experiment has rep been replicated by social scientists for years in many different contexts. But the general message is play nice, make the other side like you. 95% of all cases settle. And so you want the other side to give you what you're asking for. So you want to engage in good negotiating behavior, productive negotiating behavior gets you a better result. If you insult them and you call them names or you do something particularly unlikable, they're not going to want to give it to you. Your clients are already in disharmony. They have a dispute and they are not getting along. And so if you and the lawyer can get along, be respectful, give discovery extensions if it's not going to hurt your case or your litigation. Um, but if you can do something to trigger this type of liking effect, it is going to be advantageous to your client. Given 95% of the chan chance, you're going to be settling this dispute. So we do it for you. In mediation, I thank you for this concession. I'm reframing to make communications positive and productive. Um, anytime one of you compliments the other, I'm bringing that over. Um, we're doing this. But when you're negotiating without us, please keep that in mind. Um, don't set a summary judgment for the day, opposition due the day after somebody's daughter's getting married. Um, keep, you know, try to be respectful here. The number one way to get cases settled is to build trust and rapport. We are naturally, and if you look at unconscious influences, um, we are naturally built to be collaborators, you know, trigger all of this um, in your mediation, I, I'm or in your litigation, not just your mediation. I'm here to tell you, I see it work all the time. I see people accept settlement evaluations from the other side because they trust the other side. They like the attorney. Um, it really has a strong influence. So it's not just the rules that I would encourage you to pay attention to, but also think about how that can really that advantage your clients here. I would join Stacy in that observation. I apologize for my dogs. I just wanted to add, and I don't, you know, it's just as part of in my experience, I was a police officer, I was a DA, and they tried, you know, 60 jury trials, 40 court trials. It is so effective when you can just bridge that emotional, I like her. It is so influential. And I find it is true in the mediating group. And I find it is true with lawyers. I get excited with the civil lawyers because I want to work with them. You know, so I, I cheerlead on that one, Stacy, absolutely. And to bring this Full circle back to AI. There is an AI program. There's actually several, but the two we'll just bring up. You know, you 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 or your client are not very happy. You're in a bit of a funk. You you this example here. Hey, jerk, take your settlement offer and shove it. There's AI software that will fix your email, put it in nice speak, rewrite it for you. Um, and so this is one of them. Uh, this one is particular is uh, I think polite posts. Is a chat bot that will do it. Chat GPT. It's on chat GPT plus. That's where I saw the plus. And it's on po.com. This is the flight post when you see um, that will do that for you. And I think that's so fun. And so, so great when you can't reach the nice words because you're not filling them. Mm -hmm. So before you send that hostile uh, message and the last slide, last but not least, is the one I've been referring to. Um, and that is all of the different AI resources. And this list, if you look at the detail, it talks about 
specifics for contract writing, for writing legal claims, for legal research, legal analytics. And, and I, I found this to be invaluable. I didn't create it. I, I am using it from other resources, but please consider these different resources in your experiment. One question I do want to answer that I saw that some of these resources have a fee. You'll, I, I can't give you a blanket answer. Some are free. So you'll have to check out the ones you're interested in. And thank you. I think we're at, out of time. We're almost out of time, Katie and Stacy. Thank you, Stacy, for letting time. me learn from you and, and train with you. Thank you. And I feel the same. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. It was a pleasure to be here and to be on this panel with you, Anita. So thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful time. Enjoy the rest of your programs. ADR Services, Inc. has been your unwavering partner in alternative dispute resolution. But as the world changed, so did we. From virtual and hybrid hearings to our ongoing on-demand CLE program, ADR Services, Inc. continues to keep resolution and legal education at the forefront, woman-owned and operated from the start. There is someone for every situation. We are ADR Services, Inc.